You want to just get into it? Sure. All right. All right, welcome back to Lineheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lou Aviv in San Diego, California. And today I'm joined by Nick Knowles, who is a personal trainer. He is a former Division I collegiate wrestler, uh, guitar hero. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks for being on today, man. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate so it. just to give, I said guitar hero because you're always posting stuff on Instagram about, uh, and you tear it up too. That's the thing. Um, have you, are you in a band? I'm not. I want to be, man. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of like my way to separate myself from the whole fitness world is like going Instagram and I see these these fitness people who aren't fitness people. Yeah. And so the whole guitar thing and shredding by myself is like kind of my escape from the whole fitness world. So yeah, yeah. you don't you need more um, ass selfies and Bible verses though. Totally. <laughs> if you're gonna be if you're gonna make it in this industry. <laughs> so where did you get started with? Uh, fitness. So just to give the listeners a little bit of a background, we're going to talk programming. We're going to talk about like how you kind of like go about designing a program for somebody uh, because you have a really good, the conversations we've had, you have a really good handle on how to do that. And there's a lot of philosophies out there, but I think very few people really get programming. I think it's an art uh, and I think you really get it. So we'll get into that. But where did you get started with fitness in the first place? Sure. So yeah, I I didn't really care too much for it, but my senior year in high school, 2007, um, it's when, uh, you know, George St. Pierre? Yeah. Big UFC fighter. GSP, back yeah. Then, yeah, GSP. Yep. I remember sitting there watching uh, one of his championship fights, and they had those, like, little reel, highlight reels of his training and everything. And I remember seeing that he had a strength coach. Uh-huh. At 18, I was like, that's a freaking sweet job, man. I want to do that. So when I got picked up by college, um, they asked me what I want to specialize major in, found out kinesiology, exercise science was one of my choices. And that would be a route to go into strength and conditioning. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I went about it. Um, and you were an athlete yourself. I was. Okay. Yeah. So I started wrestling, played all kinds of sports, but I wrestled from nine years old to pretty much 22. So okay, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and I didn't mention the the most important statistic. Well, most important to me. You you have like a you ran a sub five mile and you deadlifted 500 at the same time. Correct. It's not officially recorded, but yeah. But you did it. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> so you know what you're talking about. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. That's a feat that very few people, uh, including myself, have ever got to. It was a 620 deadlift, actually. That's what you hit? 620 yeah. deadlift yeah. and a sub five mile? <laughs> that's, that's a, you're living in both realms pretty, uh, pretty strongly there. Yeah. All right. So you, uh, you saw GSP as trainer and then you decided like, all right, I want to get, get involved with that. Yeah. So like the way that it, it kind of all fell perfectly together, like, um, you know, I was a big UFC fan. I enjoyed watching all that stuff. And mm-hmm. I'm like, man, I would love to, to coach fighters one day. Like, that's, that's like, the route I want to go. You know, being in more of, like, a martial arts type of combat sport, that's that just seemed like the, the best way for me to go. When I got to college, we had a strength conditioning coach. So that's where I really started falling in love for this stuff and, and seeing, like, okay, um, how can I make this a career? Okay. And uh, the, the head strength coach that we had there, his name was uh, Dave Williams. He actually just retired this year. What school? Liberty University. Okay. Yeah, should have mentioned that. Okay. Liberty University. And uh, he, uh, man, that guy's been in the game for over 30 years. So he's got more experience than I think anybody, us podcasters or people who pay, listen to yeah. this stuff we could ever listen to. So, sure. you know, I was lucky enough to get a guy like that who was my strength coach and writing our programs and he would take the time to answer questions and talk to me. Um, and then obviously everything that was kind of learning in school at the same time, it was all crossing together and, and, uh, yeah, I decided that was kind of the, the route I wanted to go. So. Okay. So wrestling, in my experience, it's a lot of what I've seen is a lot of uh, body weight movements, like uh, push-up, pull-up, sit-up type stuff, a lot of running, a lot of partner carries, a lot of things like that. But you guys were actually doing strength training. Yeah, and that's I'm glad you asked me about that because I was hoping you would. Yeah. Um, there's a big misconception, and there's a lot of people who, and I'm not going to say they shouldn't call themselves strength coaches, but there's a big... Um, there's like a big hex on, on, on barbell movements and Olympic lifting um, for fighters, or for wrestlers. Combat sports a combat athlete. Boxers. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people are pushing this, this idea like, oh, you don't, need, you don't need an external load. All you need to do is master your own body weight. But yeah, to a certain extent, obviously, yes, that's going to be better than nothing. But sure. when a fighter has hit his peak or when he's, when he's reached a certain level in his explosiveness or in his strength, how are you going to progress and move forward from there? Um, and that's that's kind of something that our strength coach I got to see that he he took into account, and uh, you know he was thinking about the different things that sports like fighting and wrestling involve. So okay. think about in wrestling, there's a lot of pulling on the neck, right? Yep. So 
is it a good idea to be doing tons of cleaning jerks up overhead, a lot of compression? You could do it, probably not too much. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to uh, when you start getting the Olympic lifts, like the clean and jerk and the snatch, mm-hmm. and you're you're looking for a sport specific adaptation, you start running into problems there, in my opinion. Yep. Because those are such a one, it's a high neurological demand, and two, it's so technique intensive that I think if you're looking to get better at a sport, chances are uh, overhead movements that like the jerk uh, or the snatch, in my opinion, don't necessarily have their place. I wouldn't say they they have the most direct carryover, but they will help um, sure. if programmed properly. Yeah. So that's not to say that you can't use another movement or another indicator is what I call it mm-hmm. to measure how that athlete is actually progressing. Mm-hmm. So um, whether that be, you know, if, wh- wh- why are we doing the clean jerk? That's really the question that you need to ask. Like, what is the point of it? Yeah. Are we trying to get the athlete to be strong overhead? Is that necessary for wrestling? No. Um, is it helping them with their triple extension, which is a very comp, pretty much any sport is an aspect that you want to, you want to improve on? Yeah, of course. What do you mean by triple extension? Extension from the ankle, the knee, the hips. So gotcha. you're looking at something like a clean, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're reaching that triple extension there from your, from sure. your second pole. Right. So, And so, and, and your argument is that in a sport, you're using that exact same extension? Yes. In wrestling? Yes. Okay. Yep. So a lot of when, you like when you're lunging forward or, yeah, <laughs> you're picking a guy up off the yeah. ground and you're slamming him down. But again, with that said, that doesn't mean that there's not, there's not other movements that are going to, you know, work on those same components. Okay. So, um, our strength coach did utilize that. Mm-hmm. I've talked to other friends who wrestled Big Ten, and they wrestled for other, like, Pac-10 schools. Yep. And their strength coaches didn't use them. Okay. And, you know, there's I'm not going to say there's there's a better way. There's obviously certain things that you got to take into account, though. Yeah. With combat type athletes. Well, and that's where the art comes in, right? Exactly. So while you're getting this, uh, we'll call it informal education from wrestling and from your strength coach, you're also doing the formal education part, the mm-hmm. kinesiology uh, and the actual, like, learning in school, right? Yep. Uh, which one do you think was more important, or do you think that they were both necessary? Um, I think it's hard. It's hard to put a. It's hard to pinpoint that. It depends which route someone wants to go. So the program that I went through, and it's obviously based on the school too. Of course. Um, like our curriculum is pretty much based off of the ACSM, it's the American College of Sports Medicine, and what their their specific focus was was to get students to either go into physical therapy, mm-hmm. um, occupational therapy, or into cardiac rehabilitation. So. We did cover a little bit of biomechanics, which is obviously necessary for the physical therapy realm, right? And um, you know any orthopedic realm. But as far as the strength and conditioning stuff goes, and the application, learning periodization, we we hardly covered it. So, like, how to pro? Even though you're learning, program design was never covered. Okay, very very little. So we might have learned like the basics on progression, but not not enough to actually like go out into the field like right after graduation and start coaching pro athletes. So so do you think that people that are maybe listening to this and wanting to get into the field, do you think that the four-year route is necessary, the, the college degree? Um, what what area of the field? That's the question I would ask. Right. So yeah. so you're, you're saying, would you redo it the same way, or would you have gone to a school that has more focus on programming and, and strength and conditioning, we'll say? I gotta be careful with how I say it because I have friends who've gone both routes. Yeah, yeah. But I don't sure. think it's necessary. Okay. I don't think it's necessary. If I were to go back, I honestly would have studied business, and and probably just have done that stuff on the side. Yeah. Because I, I would have had I had plenty of time to learn that stuff on the side. Too, right. So. And that's uh, something that people don't ever realize, and we've talked about it a little bit on the show, but you can be in a strength and conditioning, and when you uh, when you really get into that world, you realize even if you know more than ten times more than the next guy. It's not going to matter if you can't market yourself and you can't manage the back end. So I definitely see what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where we're seeing a lot of these older strength coaches kind of dwindle away. And it's it sucks to see guys who put so much time into the field and their reach is so little, you know. Yeah. Their reach is as far as the, the students and the athletes, which is great. Mm-hmm. They're, they're making a big impact. But, you know, you go see somebody who's great at marketing and put, the self, put themselves out there and they might have, you know, an eighth of the knowledge and experience that this coach has. Yeah. But they're just able to reach more people, right? So, and now it gets even weirder when you introduce social media because now it's almost not even business. Now it's like, right. what do you look like? Which is, I'm a beginner at all that, so right, I'm trying right. to get better at it. <laughs> just keep shredding the guitar, dude. Yeah, <laughs> you just gotta take your shirt off when you do. I think I lose five followers, five fitness followers for every guitar video I post. So, <laughs> sorry, stay the course. It'll pay off. All right. So then you you're wrestling and you're so you're getting both sides of the education. You get done with. Uh, your four-year degree and you're done wrestling and then uh, what's next 
So we were required to we were required to do an internship, um, and uh, we could have selected a gym. Um, we could have selected uh, strength and conditioning internship, whether that be through a college, a pro sports team, or obviously like physical therapy. Right. So I chose where I was already at um, at Liberty University, and the head strength coach there, who's who's still the head strength coach, his name is Bill Gillespie. Um, Google him. And I feel like I've heard that name. He's he's big time, man. He's, okay. He is a. Uh, Full, full of knowledge and um, that is where my learning curve like really changed and I started learning more of how I can apply everything to actual clients and to actual athletes yeah so a little bit about that dude mm-hmm. um, tooting his horn here he's a multiple time like powerlifting world champion okay um, in, the, in the bench press and I think in, in the other lifts as well but more significantly he was you know former NFL strength and conditioning coach he was actually I think have you heard of Joel Jameson no um, I think so he wrote the book eight weeks out and talks a lot about like bioenergetics and okay. and stuff like that. Well, Bill was actually his mentor for his internship. Mm. So this guy's been in the game for a long time, taking in interns, pushing them to actually like professional sports jobs. Some people going into the personal training realm. So yeah, um, that was that was where I really started picking up a lot. So that was the next step there. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. I see. I struggle with because I've got uh, I'm getting out of the military. I've got my degree is done. Um, I have like an HR business degree, but when you look at, like, I, I love learning about this stuff and I look like, so there's Cal State Fullerton has uh, Dr. Andy Galpin, who's a doctor of bioenergetics yeah. and you know who he is. Uh-huh. We had him on the podcast. He is, uh, he runs that program and it's so strength and conditioning focused. And yeah, I'm they like, have a phenomenal program. They do, right? Yeah. So they even put on meets and they're like leading a lot of testing and research yeah. and that there's like that end of it. But then there's also like this kind of biohacker other end of it where it's like, you can learn on your own terms just as much as you want if you immerse yourself. And so I'm trying to figure out like, even for, for my education and then also for people that are listening to this that are like wanting to get more into fitness because the industry is growing like exponentially oh, right yeah. now. So I, and it's like trying to figure out that balance of like, is it worth the time? I think it really comes down to whether you want to be kind of entrenched in the research side of it or you want to just be out doing it. Because I think if you want to be out doing it, you just, like you like you're saying like you grow the most when you're learning from people that are doing it. absolutely absolutely that have seen the reps and it's what's great about that um, you know having someone who can mentor you and I would recommend since we're on this subject anybody listening that's that's thinking about personal training or you're thinking about getting the strength and conditioning field I recommend going to a collegiate strength and conditioning facility because hmm. that's that's a whole nother level of coaching even if you don't plan on coaching athletes. It's just the structure, the way that they program, the way that they think, the way that they respond to issues, and and uh, you know delivering the message to the athletes. It's just on a whole nother level. What, what do you mean by that? Like a, a team, like a sports team? Absolutely. You're so saying. let's say because with mine we worked with a sports team. Okay. Uh, we had eighty football players, and they weren't you know they were they were a double A team. They okay. weren't uh, they weren't you know a top twenty or anything. right right. It's not Clemson, but, but uh, exactly right. But nonetheless, we still had guys going into the NFL. So like you you know when I'm some little you know, pimply 22 year old intern, mm-hmm. you know, trying to coach up some dude who doesn't know me and he's going to the NFL next year. Like, yeah. You got to get kind of good at delivering, you know, technique yeah, and how true. to coach. So, yeah, that's and true. it was kind of nerve wracking at first, to be honest. So, yeah, I never even really thought about that. So, um, so we'd probably put that slightly above your CrossFit level one then. I would say so. <laughs> I'm just I, well, I would say so because the the hours that you had to put into it. I mean, yeah. And again, you like you don't have to take an internship. Even even volunteering, and I I even continued to kind of observe a little bit after, and I end up training with some of the strength coaches for for a couple months, and that's where I continued learning and and, and learning more outside of the sports world, more about kind of the strength sports. Mm-hmm. Um, but just spending time, even if it's two hours a week, man, of just like, hey, asking the strength coach, can I can I sit in on practices, or hey, can I can I walk around while you guys coach and I don't know, maybe I'll clean up your mats or something or wipe down the weights. Just that stuff is going to, it's going to carry over a ton for anyone who's serious about being a good coach. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to be hungry for it, for information. Absolutely. I, we put out a mini soda a couple weeks ago where I talked about how to like pick a personal trainer. And one of the things that I said, which was a little bit counterintuitive to maybe a lot of the advice you would get is don't if and if a personal trainer leads with their certifications, they probably haven't done that much. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's like, yeah, I'm laughing because I kind of I'm I'm one of the most uncertified people you'll meet for right. how many years I've been doing this. Which so. is just it, it's so unimportant. <laughs> it, it matters a little bit, but at the end of the day, if that's just something I've noticed, I'm like, okay, this guy's not done a lot, and so he's going to lead with like 
hey, I just passed my... Yeah, and yeah. I'm not taking a dump on people who, who want to attain these certifications because, you know, it is, it is you do build a good network circle and stuff too. You do, and, and it's yeah. professional development and you learn, Absolutely. you learn something. It's it's a tool for the toolbox, right? right? But my direction, I've, I've seen no need to yeah. to expand in that area. So so where you're at right now, when, when somebody comes to you to get programming, and this is, this is something else I'm interested in, if you came up through CrossFit, right? CrossFit will be your methodology. That would be like the base you start from. Mm -hmm. Now, if you only know CrossFit, you're probably not going to be a great coach, right? If you don't know how to adapt to someone that needs to scale and move in different ways. And like if you think, uh, if you started in CrossFit and you think that the curl has absolutely no uh, functionality, then you're probably not going to be a good coach. You probably shouldn't be a coach. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, same thing if you're uh, if you started on the other side in like a regular 24 hour fitness, right. And you look at CrossFit and you're like, there's nothing that I could learn from them. You're probably like any anytime I see dogmatic coaches, I think you're you're probably garbage. Right. That being said, where did you where does your methodology start from? If someone comes to you to lose weight or to look good or whatever it is, whatever their mm -hmm. goals are. How do you begin that whole process of starting to program a fitness routine for them? So that all comes from simply, first off, understanding, like relaying what the person is looking for. You know, what, what does this person actually want? Okay. And how am I going to apply my expertise to that goal? It's as simple as that. And obviously, if someone's not experienced on the CrossFit side or the bodybuilding side, it may not be their place to go there. And in my opinion, they should refer out. Sure. Which I've had to do before because I don't, you know, I don't want to overstep my expertise. Right, right. It's just going to make me look stupid in the long run. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the the best approach is <laughs> with my approach. It's whatever the person needs, really. And I know yeah. it's a frustrating uh, when I when I tell people that they'll ask, like, "What's your thing? What's your specialty? What do you yeah? What do you prefer?" I'm like, uh, I prefer getting people results. Sure. You know? So you tailor it off what like the time that they have available and what they're looking for. Yeah. So I mean, if we're talking about so. I'll kind of run down like what an not necessarily an assessment, but what what I was going through my mind if I'm talking to someone or someone sends me an email and they inquire. Perfect. Um, pretty much, what it would look like: they inquire, they would fill out a regular you know questionnaire sheet that gives me the basic information I need. Yep. What their nutrition looks like: how many times a week can they train? What's the duration? How long can they train? What's any pre-existing injuries or health issues I should know about? All those things, simple questions like that, allows me to cancel out you know X Y Z. I can look at what we have now, okay, and then the rest is just kind of plug and play through simple questions. Okay. Um, I always take someone through a general assessment. If someone walks in, like if you were to walk in and be like, "Hey, Nick, I need coaching," I'd be like, "All right, I need to assess you, dude." Like, right, right. You know, but uh, for someone who's not sure, if they're if they're not at the intermediate level, I will take them through an assessment just to see how they move. There might assessment be things of like, exercises, movements, uh, exercise and body movements, really depending on what they need. So if someone's like, "Hey, dude, I want to learn Olympic lifting," I'm be like, "Okay, I want to see a squat." Right, you know? right. But if someone is, uh, hey, I want to lose weight, I don't have any injuries, I haven't trained in 10 years, I'll be like, ah, no, I'm going to take you through a couple different things Okay. to see how you move, see any if we have any gaping issues in your mobility and stability, um, and, and see what we can kind of draw. And that gives me that direction yeah. for the program where we'd actually start. So with anything, it's just like goal setting with anything else in life. Like you got to know the starting point, you got to know the end point. Sure. Um, now, obviously, with somebody who hires me as a client, that endpoint's not going to be the actual long-term goal because very unlikely someone's going to hire me and we're going to you know we're going to hammer at their three-year goal. Mm -hmm. That's just not that common. So I'd say, all right, we're starting here. This is what we got. Okay, this is the time that we have. This is the amount of days that we have. Um, this is the equipment that we have. Here's your capability. So we got three months. This is how we're going to progress from there. And when we talk periodization, mm -hmm. how uh, how long are you periodizing cycles, or is that based on their needs as well? I try to go, it, it, it depends on their needs. Okay. I definitely would re recommend most of my clients and, mo and the people who work with me online too, it's going to be at least a three-month phase. Okay. Um, like a three-month, let's say, strength building phase. Or exactly. Okay. So um, if we're looking at training, and most of most people who work with me stay for a year to two years. So okay. my retention rate's pretty good, which is exactly what any coach should want, right? Because education and actually investing in these people, teaching them how to do it once they're no longer with you is really the goal after right. all. Sure. Um, so, you know, when people are, are with me long term, like I, I take it in a seasonal approach and uh, it's so bro-ish, but, you know, it's so cliche, but, you know, summertime, unless they have an actual performance based goal, you know, seems to be the time people want to get shredded. Yeah, yeah, for know? sure. So that might be a recomp cycle or a more conditioning focused cycle. Yeah. And we'd focus on maybe eating a little more on a calorie deficit. Yep. And then fall time. Okay. You just hit all that. You know, you hit a three month fat loss cycle. 
this is a good time to take advantage of where your body composition is at and put on some muscle. Mm-hmm. You know, all right, three months from you know September to October or September to November. All right, cool. Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming around. You're packing in more calories. It's a good time to eat, really pack on muscle. Yeah. And bulk. Yeah. Which, or I'd say, like a strength hypertrophy phase. Right. Right. So there's so many ways you can go about it. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's something that I think people miss the boat on. And actually, this is something I think CrossFitters actually get right. The reason I think they get it right is because there's an open season. Mm-hmm. So every February is the open for CrossFit, which means everybody is going to. Uh, participate in the Open, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's the regionals in the game season. Most people don't ever get to the regionals in the games part, right? Especially if 10% get picked there. Right. Oh, dude, <laughs> we got to talk about that, too. <laughs> okay. I have like 20 out of 80 men tore their peck in this last Man. regional. Yeah. Someone just told me that. God yeah, it's not read the article. <laughs> One of our athletes did. Uh, Yikes. But anyway, so... <laughs> But here's what they do, right? A lot of the the general population of CrossFitters that are aspiring to get to the next level. The Open, everybody knows, is historically uh, endurance, Metcon-ish, a lot of uh, light movements, and, and it's going to matter like how fast you can do them. It'll get heavy at some point, but you'll never get to the heavy weights if you don't have the, the conditioning to get there. Sure. Right? So what happens is people do the Open. And then they look at the whole year, and, and coaches, this is what I think where they get it right, mm-hmm. is that they'll be like, okay, following the open, that's when we're going to uh, we're gonna start a strength cycle, right? Mm-hmm. And then they'll go into a technique cycle. They'll do one more strength cycle, and then knowing once like Christmas comes on, they're finishing a strength cycle, and they're going into their conditioning phase because it takes a lot less time to get conditioned. And they're just maintaining that foundation they built. Exactly. And that's pretty much sports periodization. Yep. You know. And so that is something that I think a lot of the other populations in fitness mm-hmm. kind of fuck up. So I, I like Absolutely. that you look at the whole year out and project like, okay, we know going into summer, you are going to want to be lean. It's just a human trait. Yeah. Like if they don't have performance school, obviously. Right, right, so. right. And it's something I heard, I forget who, who was saying it, that uh, I think it was Mike Kizertel was talking about it. Um, renaissance periodization guy and he was he was saying that even for the general population it really hit home for me even those type people if i got a 55 year old guy who's like hey dude i want to lose weight he's got money he can hire me for a whole year sure you know he's not going to hit a fat loss cycle for the entire year you know even even in the smallest details i might you know gear six weeks or eight weeks towards building strength on a specific exercise yep and then we'll back down maybe deload and focus more on maintaining that while improving conditioning and then move along to something else and that's that's what keeps from from my experience my personal training clients it really keeps them entertained yeah and it, it makes them th- it makes them realize like hey like this whole strength training thing you know it doesn't have to be so boring and it also doesn't have to be you know a constant ass kicker every single week that has no direction yeah so that's that's kind of my approach really yeah so and that's where crossfitters tend to get it wrong right is they get into that constant ass kicker with no direction yeah it's just got to match your training yeah you, you can't you can't peak in both capacity i mean you can but yeah. it's only going to be so quick, right? You can't you can't rush that. So sure. And I'm painting with a broad brush when I say crossfitters. I'm just no, you know, I understand in general. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I actually want to get your opinion on this. So I've been reading Unbreakable Runner, um, which is a Brian McKenzie book, and I'm not sure how much you work with endurance populations, but I think you could probably answer this based on strength as well. One of the arguments that they say in that book, and I'm not sure how much maybe even his thoughts have evolved because it's an older book is that instead of periodizing like leading up to a race and peaking Mm -hmm. right and being at 100 percent for a race if you were to periodize every two weeks and kind of hit all of the facets in a periodization every two weeks Mm -hmm. then you would essentially carry like a 90 percent ready rate all year round instead what do you think about that are you talking about kind of like a like a wave type periodization right so let's say with running you would do you would periodize like lifting except you would do speed work and then you would do distance work and in then you would do like technique work and you would periodize it just mm-hmm. like you were lifting but uh so I, i'm curious like what's your opinion about maybe trying to hit all of the facets every two weeks instead of periodizing for 12 weeks at a time you think you'd be kind of counterintuitive you mean all the facets as in in application to weight training yeah um so they were, break that down a little more for me all right so let's say uh let's say i'm uh I'm general fitness and I want to get stronger, faster, and I want to look better, right? Mm-hmm. You would generally periodize those where you would get stronger for 12 weeks, right? Or, or whatever right. long. And then you would move on to the next phase. You would maintain, try to maintain as much strength as you just created. Uh, and then you would move on to the, let's okay, say, Okay, I understand loss. what you're saying. I completely agree with what he's saying. And I, I don't want to people to kind of take it the wrong way. I'm not saying when I say a strength phase, that doesn't mean that we completely drop 
conditioning and that we completely uh you know leave out any hypertrophy high repetition work involved yeah so that's what i'm trying to get at like how much right. are you doing these other things while you're i, I i'm not going to put like a percentage on on how much okay you know, i do of what versus the other but you know there's going to be more of a specific focus let's just say if uh for example if, mm-hmm. if peak strength is the goal okay you know if this person actually wants to stay healthy i'm not gonna i'm not gonna have them unless they have a competition i'm not gonna have them do you know working above 90 percent on on you know a certain lift like let's just say they're doing cleans or something mm-hmm. and then have them going you know 90 percent again on squats and then they're gonna hit bench press and be doing like reps of like you know four to six reps right you know i try i try to hit pretty much every um at least throughout the week every uh I guess you could say not energy system, but every intensity throughout the week. Okay. So, and that's, that's common in like the conjugate method where, and I use it, it's very commonly used with a lot of the hybrid type athletes. Yep. Um, and I know Alex Viata had talked about it. Yep. Um, using that max effort day, you know, in a dynamic effort day or repetition effort day, mm-hmm. that that allows you a little more room to train at different intensities throughout the week yep. and hit these different components instead of just being like linear the entire time. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So how long do you build volume until you uh, deload, typically? Usually, I go in waves. So in regards to what type of volume, volume for strength work or volume for... Does it change? Does it change for you? I have a bunch of different ways that I can periodize. Okay. So I can, I can cross volume and intensity. I can just go based on intensity and, and progress there mm-hmm. and then take a dip in that and go up in volume. There's so many ways that you can, you can work it. One that I found to work the best is going in three-week blocks. So having where intensity goes up, 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 and then we back down on the fourth week. And then the volume goes up, and then the intensity still kind of goes up. Does that kind of make sense there? Sure. And it might be hard for the listeners to get a visual of that. But. How do you how do you make the intensity go up? Are you, was that more of your like AMRAP type workouts, as many rounds as possible in a certain amount of time? Or how are you stacking intensity then? Well, if we're so if we're talking about conditioning, stacking the intensity, that would just be your how much out your output, really. Okay. So let's just say we're talking about running. Okay. Yep. Their pacing could change. So if I'm, if I, let's just say, for example, an athlete has, you know, just, just putting that out there, like a four, four by 400 meter, you know, run, yeah. keep it at a one to two work to rest ratio. And you're going to work at, you know, this guy's training for a 1.5 mile run. So obviously he can train at 105%, right? Yep. That is pace. Right. It's a one to two ratio anyway. You should be able to keep that no problem. Okay. So maybe the next week, then I might add a set and then add another set. Mm-hmm. Week number four, I'll go back down to the initial volume. And then we're going to go up to 110%, and then add a set, and then add a set. And then so, and instead of going back down, I'm not going to go to 115% on this pacing. That's yep. too much. So now what I'll do, I'll cut that work-to-rest ratio from 1, point, 1 to 2 mm-hmm. to maybe 1 to 1. 1.5. Does that kind of make sense? Exactly. So now we're closing the gap on the intensity and volume. Yeah. So Okay, perfect. Yeah, mm-hmm. so then you're starting to work that lactate threshold exactly. at the end. That's, that's something I've used for guys who've like approached me for you know, improving their PRT times and stuff. So okay, PRT. You're talking about the military, yeah, just like different military run run and guys. stuff like that. Yep, perfect. All right, so let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your training. So sure. <laughs> uh, if you you had a 620 pound deadlift at the same time you're running a sub five mile, uh-huh. what, what was your mile? It was a uh, 517 unofficially. Okay, yeah, so 517. 517. So you're not going to run a 517 mile or get a 620 deadlift if you're not an athlete. So there's a there's a good general preparedness that you uh-huh. came to the table with. I think it's good to throw it. I weighed like 222, so. Did you? Yeah, I was hauling for a big guy. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's a fast mile for 220 yeah. pounds. Uh, <laughs> that's really fast, actually. So what does your training, what did your training look like in order to achieve something like that? I was an absolute minimalist. So what I did uh, during that time, I pretty much focused on what I needed to improve. Minimalist in your approach to training or wearing five finger shoes? <laughs> <laughs> the approach to training. Okay. The approach to training. So pretty much when you're when you're cross crossing multiple goals, and I know that this has probably been something that's been talked about multiple times on this podcast. No, we actually know. haven't talked about it at all. No, okay. I'm excited about it. So uh, and, and I'm no expert on this. This sure. is just something I've kind of starting to develop in and, yeah. and, and applying to some of my clients who've reached out to me. Um, well you did it yourself too. Yeah. Okay. So it's definitely definitely an area that, that I'm growing in and and I think I could give back a little bit to that, that military community. But yeah. uh, Well, more people want to be fast and strong right. than want to be one or the other. The strong thing's getting more popular now, which is really cool. Yeah. And I've noticed that with like, the gym. Yep. You know, tons of military guys yep. are trying to get strong. Yeah, Sorry, the military, but I'm the one. <laughs> no, it's good. In the military, you don't want to pick. Like, you, you don't want to be like really – you don't want to be that guy that's really strong and then can't can't mm-hmm. hump with a rucksack and vice versa. You don't want to be the guy that right. can run forever and can't carry a fucking rucksack. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. 
So this is actually really applicable, I think, to more of the population than... Sure. Yeah. So in regards to the whole minimalism thing, Mm -hmm. um, I just had no fillers. There was no... I I would call it junk work. I didn't do any junk work, so... Yeah, in running, they call them junk miles. Yeah. Right? So if I'm going to... You know, my goal is to... You know, if I wanted to hit a... You know, my goal is to hit that 620-pound deadlift, you know, I would focus my training towards, okay, obviously, I need to train the deadlift... Mm-hmm. And then I need to look at what uh, what range of motion or what, where's my sticking point. Okay, I'm going to pick movement that would be specific to that. Is it necessary for me to pick anything else after that? Especially if I'm using that conjugate method. I have another day where I'm training based off of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at, at a different intensity or different volume. So So you're talking about accessory work. You're, you're reducing. Exactly. Okay. So simply put, I, I literally did four leg ex- lower body exercises a week. Okay. That's it. So like a day where I was, I would combine the running and the lifting. On the heavier day, like my max effort type day, mm-hmm. I might do, let's just say hypothetically, five by three deadlift at, you know, 70, 70, 78%. Okay. Maybe follow that up with a front squat or somewhere around four to six reps at a pretty high intensity for, you know, three to five sets. Okay. And then I get the fuck out. <laughs> okay. So how much, how much training were you doing then? Like how, how, is there, are we talking like an hour a day or... Well, you know, anybody who lives heavy, they know that it just drags out. You know? yeah. So even though it sounds like, yeah, the, this meathead over here just spent an hour doing two exercises. I mean, you obviously have to, especially with deadlifts, setting up the weight. You know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, and you got to put, you got to log time under tension. Right. So yeah. I'm dragging out the rest. And, and there were times where I actually would periodize uh, rest periods. Um, that's something that you can manipulate too, but we'll save that maybe for another conversation yeah. or, or later here. But uh, yeah, that, w- that was... Uh, I would pretty much, you know, I would I would go through the deadlift, go through the, go through a front squat, and then take a little break, get some carbs in me, and then I go on my my interval runs. So that's it. Okay. Yeah. Would you do it just like that, where you would lift and then run? Yep. Really? Yep. Because when I run after lift, that feels like junk miles to me. Oh, ter- absolutely. Yeah. It was just a time thing. Right. Right. I'm on oh, my okay. feet most of the day too, so yeah, I yeah. just try to get it done. Get it done. Yeah. 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 But I would I would recommend you know. Um, getting the lifting done in the morning and then hitting the running later at night. Were, was that your goal? Like I want to sub six mile and over 600 deadlift or were you, was your goal just like all of a sudden you just realized like, Oh shit. I well, I was can... training for a mile and a half time actually to improve that. Um, and I kind of want to see how, how well I can do there. And, uh, at the same time I was, I was training jujitsu and getting ready for a competition. And I was also doing, uh, you know, I had a power lifting meet coming up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, during my, one of my tempo days, it, I was supposed to hit a mile. I was feeling great that day. Yep. And I just went ham. I just went after it. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was like unplanned. It was actually after a lift that I hit it. Okay. And I was like, whoa, did I really just get that time? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's that's fine. Not saying I might hit that again anytime soon, but was, yeah. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, I was I was always I've always kind of rid around being you know, keeping those same numbers up with my lifting and then and then keeping my running pretty you know. Well conditioned, yeah, with, sure. the, with the mid distance running. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that minimalism is probably the most important factor if you are trying to be good at multiple facets. Absolutely, this is actually where again, see, I, I always go back to CrossFit because I think we have a lot of people that listen that mm-hmm. are CrossFitters, and it's generally a very open population of people that are willing to learn new things. Mm-hmm. The problem with that, you have you have multiple facets, so you would think the middle, minimalism approach would be good, but any competition is so, the volume so heavy in a competition, like even, not even, we'll not even talk regionals and games, which is like, that's a whole nother level, but if you just do these random like two, three day competitions that are like local, right? you know, it, you're looking at like anywhere from three to nine workouts. Right. So you, you almost have to do the volume because you need to be able to handle it. You know what I mean? Well, in my recommendation, and I'm not, I'm no CrossFit coach. Um, I never coach anybody who competes, but okay. just from based off of what I would see, yeah, like that person should have a day specifically built towards competition type days, mm-hmm. you know, and they should be periodizing that. Yeah. I know a lot of like with the competitions, it might be like an unknown kind of workout, um, but they should be ready for that stuff. Right. You know, if you're not, if you're not hitting, it's kind of like in wrestling, like, you know, a wrestling tournament lasts all day long. And if you're, if you plan on winning the tournament, you're going anywhere between five to six matches. Oh, and really? Especially at the college level, they're, oh, okay. they're dog fights, man. Yeah. Damn. So you're going to be tired. Yeah. So you best bet that on a Saturday when we weren't competing, we had competition days 
in the practice room. Right. And we would mimic what a competition would look like. Okay. So, and that's kind of how you would how you would. That's kind of how I would if I were to get used to that. Athletes. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I actually, never even thought about doing just like mock. I mean, people test out the workouts from a competition. Right. But doing a full mock day where you like go through your entire pre workout prep, everything, what you're going to eat. Yeah. Do that or they, they should at least know what it feels like to hit the wall in a particular, you know, and how to get through that or what you need to do, like, nutrition-wise <clears throat> to recover. Yeah. Because they get the competition day that happens for the first time. And for most people, we saw this at Murph the other day. Yeah. They hit the wall and they're done, man. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, cause you redline fast, you yeah. know. And if you don't have a lot of competition experience, so, like, I've competed a lot. I just, it's, I compete a lot. So I have the wherewithal now when a competition starts to slow myself down. And get my shit together mm-hmm. and not come out too hard. But man, those first like three or four CrossFit competitions I did, or even first ultra marathons I did, you go out way too hard. Mm-hmm. And then you red line and then you're fucked. That's happened to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. But the pacing thing is a tough, tough thing to tackle, especially if you're not training year round based off that goal. Right. So, yeah. But CrossFit aside, if you want to get strong and uh, be able to run either endurance or fast, I would say minimalism, cutting out those junk miles is probably the like, number one most important thing you could do absolutely the problem i'm running into right now is like i'm trying to i want uh, i don't know if i want to say this <laughs> i want to uh i want to be a nationally ranked strongman and i want to be able to run 100 miles in under 24 hours at the same time that's badass that's an ambitious goal same day uh, uh no, say, i want to be able to do it within the same like, same. month okay you know what i mean <laughs> so i want to be capable of those things right yeah um and that's kind of like what I've been working towards. My problem is I like the junk miles. Like I like to be like if it's six o'clock at night and I have nothing going on, I'm like oh, I'm just gonna run, clear my head, think about shit. Yeah, and that's the thing. I like I'm not taking away from people who if you enjoy the process, you love training. You know, obviously we gotta love what we do. And if, if it's if it's freaking boring, and right. if if your training doesn't match not only your goal but your passion, then you're kind of you're running yourself on the ground for no reason. But you know if you're gonna dedicate yourself to a goal, yeah. it's, it's got to be direct. Yeah. So, otherwise, right. you're just spinning your wheels for nothing. Right. So. Exactly. And that's that's what I just realized is I've been running a lot of ultras lately and getting faster and, and I'm adapting really well to that environment. And then I went back up and I picked up like a 405 deadlift and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a long process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, now I'm like back on the drawing board. Like, okay, let me figure out how I'm going to periodize this thing. Yeah. And it might even be a thing where I have to get a coach because... A lot of times, I think that even if you're a great athlete, you need that unbiased view. Absolutely. You know, yeah. From the outside to look at what you're doing uh, and, and how you're doing it and then mm-hmm. to kind of go from there. Yeah, sometimes you need a coach to tell you when to put on the brakes and then coach to tell you when to suck it up. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So. so, following your internship mm-hmm. with, uh, and, and then did you move into personal training from there or? Yeah, so. During my internship, I uh, I was actually planning on going into uh, into the strength and conditioning field. I had, had a few job interviews um, kind of lined up, but at the same time, I uh, I got offered to be actually the, one of the assistant wrestling coaches and kind of the strength coach for my wrestling team that I, that was wrestling okay. for previously. Yep. So uh, I took that and, and stayed in town. And at the same time, I was personal training at a local gym, and then also kind of like sticking around, hanging around, and, and lifting with a lot of the, the strength coaches there. Mm-hmm. Um, if we had like at the, at that time in that gym we had three world record holders in our workouts yeah. so that's where i really started learning he must have progressed a ton a ton yeah yeah i went from a dude who thought he was strong to realizing like wow this yep. is a, this is a whole different world yep and that's where my love for actual strength sports i i used to be like that kind of like mid intensity type athlete yep and then uh you know, I fell more in love with the heavy weights and wanted to learn more about it. So I, I dedicated all my training to that and just kind of like left the left the whole wrestling thing and, and uh, conditioning thing behind. You know, I was running a little bit, but nothing too serious. Yeah. So, yeah, at that time I was, I was working at a gym. Um, when I was done coaching, uh, I had maybe the summer left to kind of figure things out. And I was engaged at the time. My wife's from out from right here in Virginia Beach. Okay. And uh, so I followed her out here and no strength and conditioning jobs out here. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I went to the first team I could find, and I've, yeah. So there's, uh, yeah, there's not a lot of teams around here. No, we might get that NBA team. Yeah, in Virginia Beach. <laughs> but man, you just touched on something that I think is super important, which is if you're in a place with a lot, of, like high energy, there's obviously something to be said for people that are better than you. You're you're gonna have to level up, right? Mm-hmm. But the energy in a place like matters so much. If you're in a gym with high energy, like 
where I, I went to this gym in San Diego, uh, State Classy CrossFit, and when people were in there, like on our barbell club nights, the cops would get called. Like legitimately the cops would come because they thought like we were having a party or something because <laughs> it was so loud and people are hitting PRs and fucking yeah. smashing weights and yelling. And it's like, dude, you would grow so much. I hit PRs that I've never hit since because the energy was so crazy. That makes a very big difference, man. It does. Yeah. Uh, and it's the same thing with anything, whether it's entrepreneurship. Like right now we're at a co-working space. I was talking about it. It's like just being in here, the energy of people that are creating things mm-hmm. and that are trying to fucking put a dent in the universe is like it just makes you so much better at what you're doing. Absolutely. So that that's something that I, I would definitely say like if you are – if you feel plateaued, that's another way to get around it. Like, yeah, go sur- find a bunch of guys stronger than you. Yeah, <laughs> surround yourself with people that are. Uh, yeah, but a lot of people don't like to do that, and we, we both know why. It's, it's that, intimidating. It's well, it's humbling. It's hum- yeah, that's a lot true of people too. never want to get to that. Right. They're too. They're too proud. They're too uh, proud yep. to take that next step. Yeah. And like you know, where I was at, I was at a at a decently high level. You know, as as a wrestler, I, I qualified for the NCAA tournament, so I was you know one of the top thirty two guys in the country at the time. Sure. So I you know I was I thought I was tough. But from a powerlifter standpoint, in the powerlifting world, I was not tough. Right. And a lot of athletes think that, oh, I was successful in this area, so I'm going to crush it here. It's like, no, man. Yeah. Like, you can't just walk in here and, and uh, think that you're going to take over. Right, you right. Know, and, and step on everyone's toes. Like, it's it's a new world. Yeah. And you got to surround yourself and grow with, with people in that, that, that realm. So. Right. Yeah, people, um, people that – if you want to be great at something, you have to be willing to take that humble pie, I think, and – you know, I don't, I don't know what the saying is, but it's like there's people that are humble and then there's people that are about to be. Right? <laughs> Maybe. And, and if you're not, then you're never going to grow. And then you're just dumb. Right. So uh, <laughs> talking plateaus then, because um, we just talked about a little a little bit, but plateauing is something I think a lot of people, they'll get programming. When you start working out, even if your programming's not great, if you follow it to a T and, mm-hmm. it, and it progresses in a linear fashion at all, you will get, you'll get uh, results, right? Absolutely. So, but then what happens is a lot of people will plateau, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how many people have been going in the gym and doing the same uh, 10 by, or let's say like 3 by 12 (laughs) hammer curls with 35 pounds. And that's what they do on their bicep day every single time, right? Or whatever. Or flip the card. You got Olympic lifters who are always trained above 90%. Yeah. You know? (laughs) Right. And so they plateau and they, and maybe it's subconscious. They don't even realize how long they've been at these same fucking weights and Mm -hmm. rep schemes. Um, how do you go about pl- uh, programming around a plateau? How programming around a plateau? Yeah. Well, there's there's a ton of different ways you can go about it. Um, if it's a lifter, yep, specifically lifter. Yeah, let's go with the lifter. You know, they're gonna if they're plateauing, it's probably gonna be at a sticking point. You know, with the lift, some type of some area in that range of motion to lift where they're failing, and mm-hmm. you need to bring up that area. So something as simple as maybe adopting a new exercise or adding in more volume towards another, you know, building up those muscle groups to where they're weak, why they can't move the weight in that, that certain position. So like that's if they're everything. having trouble, they can get a deadlift off the ground, but they're having trouble with that second pull. That's what you're saying. Right. Something you would train like as, block pulls or something. Right. So okay. like, let's say if, uh, let's say if an, an athlete, like an athlete, he's the dude squats 405. Okay. Which is, you know, pretty good. Sure. So, um, he squats 405, but he, he can't, he can't get to 420 and he keeps, he keeps getting stuck out of the bottom. Okay. okay. Well, where's he feeling at? Is it his trunk strength? Is it his lower? Is it his upper back strength? Is it his, uh, you know, is it his legs? Why not just improve both? Yeah. And here's my answer to this, and a lot of people get really frustrated when I say this. Okay. Build more muscle. Right. That usually helps. Sure. That usually helps. Right. Um, if you have the strength base, you have the foundation. Building more muscle and then going back into your strength training and your cycle, you're you're going to be stronger. Well, so how are you going to do that though? What a lot of guys I would recommend they do, yeah, is if you're gonna let's so I would call that a hypertrophy phase, and obviously if it's if it's hypertrophy phase based off a certain sport uh, or if or a strength sport, mm-hmm. you know we're gonna wanna we're gonna wanna build muscle in the areas where they're lacking, not just general hypertrophy training, bodybuilding training, right? So we would add more volume. We might back down on their intensity on their main lifts. Maybe instead of well, what we normally do is I would I would say okay, so here's your max. Let's go ahead and take that. Down ten percent. So, what? Let's just say three hundred. You know, you're going to train around two eighty is your max from now on. Okay, so you're you're training quality form, all right. But it's not fatiguing you too much. It's not fatiguing your CNS. Now we're able to focus on on your volume work, and it gives you a little more you know energy in the tank to focus on your volume stuff. Okay, so you can have more output there. And then once we you know felt that we've hit that first sufficient amount of time, 
let's just say eight to 12 weeks, mm-hmm. then we'll go back, bring that intensity back up, train at your regular max, kind of like cross them over, mm-hmm. you know, get that volume to get a little, a little bit lower, go back to your original training. And if that person has grown in those weak points, you know, I would say that they should be stronger. Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh, I completely agree with that actually. Um, from an Olympic lifting standpoint, I, uh, plateaued at 225 with my snatch for a very long time. Mm-hmm. But it was because, like you said, I'd always just work up. I'd do a bunch of work around 90%. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, I just I didn't get better. And then what I did is I did a uh, eight-week squat cycle. Okay. I did a strength cycle. Uh, just squatting, though. Uh, and I did accessory work. But the focus of my life was to get a stronger get squat. Get that leg power I up. squatted three yeah. times a week. And, it, and that's it. And then I was like, God, I don't know. But my coach was like, it will transfer, I guarantee you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, I went right up to like a 265 snatch. Like within, Dang, man, that's awesome. I did, that was probably like, I did two cycles of that. Nice. I did a cycle, I hit 245. I did another cycle, I hit 265. And I was like, well, God damn. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It wasn't even working, snatch. And sometimes it, it could be something as simple as, as changing the volume up and changing the intensity. Some people, they've been, you know, working at a, you know, different things work for different people. Obviously, there's some programs are better than others. Yeah. Um, regardless of what the person is, is capable of or where they're at. There's sure. some programs that are dog crap out there. Yep. Um, but certain splits work better for certain people because you got to take into account, you know, it's not just the training and their weak points. Think about think about what their day looks like. You know, think about what their eating looks like, yep. what their stress levels look like. Like those are all going to play into account. You know, if I, if I have a guy who's working a 60-hour work week and he, he says he wants to get strong, I'm like, dude, like you're not – you're not going to be training six times a week. Like this might drag out a little bit longer or you might need to organize your training differently. Mm-hmm. So, and, and how you're eating. Yeah. So it wouldn't be an optimal training program per se to reach his goal, but it'd be optimal for his lifestyle and yeah. how that's going to match his goal. Gotcha. So. Something I've gotten into recently and, and we don't have to get super in the weeds about it, but something I've gotten into recently is cycling my food to match my training cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure what your thoughts are. I know you do you do handle nutrition for your clients. I do. Um, it, it, do you give them more of a general purpose, eat like this, uh, eat these macros kind of thing? Or are you programming their food based off what you're programming for their fitness routine? Oh, always based off their fitness routine. Okay. Every single person, no matter what. You'll see people who hand out templates. And it'll be like, all right, your body weight's this, your goal's this. So here's... You know, the, the the energy at expenditure is different based off every goal. Right. You know, and I have a problem with that. It, with the amount of calories burned and how to kind of match that. No, I have a problem when people say... Uh, handing a template. Handing a template. Yeah. Just eat this macro uh, based on whatever fucking calculation I have in the back end here. I do too. Yeah. It works. Is it... Are we teaching these people anything? Or are we teaching them good habits? I would be failing in my job if I did that. Yeah. So the way I look at it is... You gotta obviously cover the basics and the fundamentals of nutrition. These people need to know like what a healthy food is, what mm-hmm. a better option is, what a crappy option is, and kind of the way that I go about it is I have like a like a three three levels of, of food items. So I'd have like your best option, your uh, I'm in a rush option, mm-hmm. and then your I have nothing else good around me option. Okay, and um, that is kind of put into like columns based off of however many meals per day they're eating and. I, I change it obviously if, if they have a training day that's going to look different than a rest day. Yeah. Um, a really really heavy leg day or high volume day on on running or something is going to be different in calories required, you know, versus a rest day. So okay, it's definitely a little more than just here's your macros, here's yeah, your yeah. calories. So, do you know who uh, Mike Dolce is? Yeah. Okay, so the Dolce diet. Uh-huh. He uh, he has some really cool things to say. He's got a podcast, and I, I he like rants a lot, but I just like to listen to it. <laughs> but one of the things he said, and this stuck with me, because you just mentioned your there's nothing around food, right? Uh-huh. It's like you're just in a pinch and you got to eat something. That's my life. My life. I live too. off that. So check this out. This is what he said. <laughs> so me too. I'm always like, oh fuck, I trained and I'm starving, right? And so I got to get food. And I, some calories are probably better than no calories, even though actually that's kind of evolving in my head too. <laughs> but what he said is he's like, well, and somebody was like, oh, I was, and I, this hit home because I just done it. I was leaving work and I was like, I'm starving. I'm like, there's a subway here. So I stopped and I got like a sandwich or whatever. And then I felt like shit because I ate a, a ton of bread and I just felt like garbage. <laughs> and his thing was like, well, hold on. Did you not know you had to eat lunch on a fucking Tuesday? Like, what do you mean there was nothing around? There's nothing around because you didn't plan for it. Oh, absolutely. Right? And so that's just uh, in my head that's something I've been, been, like, really trying to nail down is, like, 
Yes, it's Tuesday. You're gonna eat lunch today. Well, the lunch thing that's that's a bullshit excuse. But like, I didn't have time. I'm like, okay, dude. Like, yeah, but well, I knew cook. I was gonna train. Too, right, right, right. No, I'm not. I'm not coming down here for that. But it's the it's usually breakfast. Yeah. Like so, like I, I get up every day at like four thirty or five. Okay. So I don't have time to go cook freaking eggs and oatmeal. Right, right. I just don't. Yeah. So I make a shake. Yeah. And it's really not that bad. But that's my I'm in a rush. I got nothing around type of thing. It's that's not like I'm saying. going to McDonald's and right, grabbing. Right. Okay. Oh well, it meets my macros, so you know. Right. It's, it's okay. And yeah. And I've done that plenty yeah. times, but. <laughs> yeah. Now the if it fits your macros is like I, I have done that, but yeah. I should probably delete all those posts on Instagram where I talked about that. Yeah. Well, sometimes, dude, I, I'll fucking post my Ben and Jerry's, dude. Just, you know, but just staying on myself about nutrition and, like, trying to figure out how it applies to what I'm doing that day mm-hmm. is something that is I'm finding to be extremely beneficial in my, like, evolution as an athlete, right? Absolutely. Looking at what am I doing that day? How is my food going to help or hinder that? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's just like even now, like I used to be, I'd go to lunch and grab a beer, right? <laughs> even now, like that's something that I'm like, well, hold on. If I'm trying to create something that day, like if I'm going to do a podcast, I don't want my mind to be fucking slow. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. With you that. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that, that's just a, a side note, but uh, I was just talking to my, my parents about that. It's like I, they, I don't know, but you got to figure out how is what you're doing going to get you to the goals that you want to get to? Exactly. Or is it not? Is it going to get in the way? Mm-hmm. You know? And it's, it's and for people listening, like for some, if they're kind of like just learning about this stuff, it, it might seem overwhelming. You know? Right. But when you hire a coach, a good coach should be able to simplify these things. And after all, a coach's goal is not just, to, like I said before, not to get you to your goal, but to ingrain this into your lifestyle, mm-hmm. to teach you these habits and how to use them when you no longer have a coach. Yep. Initially, it's to get these people to be independent. It should be the goal of any coach, really. Otherwise, you're just taking people's cash. And that's a good point, too. Know? So A lot of people in the fitness industry want to be guardians of the standard. Mm-hmm. They want to overcomplicate something so that you don't understand it, so that you have to pay them to tell you how to and do that, it. And usually those people who overcomplicate it, they're just they're just running in circles. They really don't know what they're talking about. Right. Yeah, I've, I've seen that happen quite a ton. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I completely agree. When you are looking for a coach, like you need to look for somebody that's got like the heart or the mind of a teacher. Absolutely, right? and that's really what it is. People, I've actually someone's asked me before. I was on a plane. What do you do? I'm like, you know, I'm gonna throw this person for a loop. Yeah, I'm a teacher. I go, what do you teach? I'm like, fitness. Nice. Yeah. And I go like at a, at a college. I'm like, not nah, a gym. Yeah. I go, you're a trainer. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> trainer and a teacher <laughs> yeah I'm a master of custodial yeah. art you're a janitor <laughs> I completely agree I think that you have to find someone that's willing to take the time to explain to you why you're doing what you're doing and you should take an interest in that as an athlete if you really want to get better oh yeah and I think that's where a lot of coaches and it, it, there's the big big like um, I guess battle in between like coaches who are active in competing and coaches who have never done crap in yeah, their career. Right. And I'd recommend, you don't have to be amazing, you don't have to be incredible, but you should train for something and you should compete in multiple realms because that's where you start developing and growing and you start learning like, all right, well, I believe this this, this entire time and man, it actually doesn't work. Right. Or hey, maybe I need to clean that up and now I can't get my clients that anymore because that, that just that's not efficient. Or that's, not, that's not the best way to go about it. So yeah, I'd recommend all coaches compete. I yeah. think you have to be amazing, but that's where you learned a ton. Right. Oh, I, I completely yeah. agree. And that's a whole other topic of dis- discussion. Mm-hmm. Like the the benefits of competing, like the what you learn about yourself and your body is like orders of magnitude over what you're going to learn from just going to the gym every day and right. not breaking your routine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another, another one of the tips I gave for picking a coach is like, what have they done? Like, what have they, where did they start? Where are they at now? Because you want to know, are they able to solve complex problems? Are they just a freak athlete who's strong, oh. never had to work for it? Like, not really, you know what I mean? It's pretty strong um, or pretty fast. Like, that matters. That matters a lot. Mm. Um, where What is their approach? Like, how hard was it for them to get where they're at? Because they're going to be able to coach you through plateaus. Exactly. Yeah, completely yep. agree. And that's kind of like with my own training now, transitioning forward, like from, you know, a year and a half to two years ago when I was doing all these – kind of like hybrid kind of goals yeah you know i'm i spent a little bit of time just kind of broing out going to the gym just trying to trying to stay fit trying to look good buys and tries yep, yep. but I'm, I'm realizing now like all right i'm kind of losing that fire in my belly and uh you know i want to be a testament to my clients that you know hey not that your coach still got it but hey i can i can find a measurable goal and reach it yeah you know and it's it's almost it's for myself too mm-hmm. you know, so 
Yeah, I, that's that's the same with me, and this is like a whole other topic you could go on, but uh, I have to compete in something, otherwise I'll lose that drive to like get in the gym and really get after it. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm running this 200 miler, and it's like, for me, that's all of the motivation in the world I, I need to never skip a day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, you know, there's an advantage to that, too. Mm. So... Cool, we're like getting to the hour point, so we'll kind of wrap it up here. But uh, if you, uh, based on everything that you know, this is a Lionheart kicker, we, we always ask all okay. the guests this, um, and I think you'll probably be coming on more shows, but <laughs> based on everything that you know, if you could uh, give blanket advice and it were guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear it and it would be translated to every language, uh, what would you tell people? Hmm. Well, we've, we've talked a lot and we've harped a lot on, on measuring and assessing, right, today. Yeah. Um, and this obviously applies to every outside of training. All these principles apply to, to life, to you know career goals, relationship goals, anything. Mm-hmm. Is to identify, to see where you want to be, you know, figure out, map out what it takes to get there. Yep. And just go as hard as you can with with all the steps that you've built to get there. Yep. You do that, even if you fall short. I think most people will be pleased with where they where they end up. Yep. Actionable plan. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's why I love sport. That's why I love fitness. Uh, it's thought organization. Yeah, really, you know. this whole thing. You can extrapolate these concepts out, and you can apply them to uh, an organization or a business or your your own personal growth in any mm-hmm. area. Uh, and that, that's why I like it. I completely agree. So come up with a plan, actionable steps, and then fucking knock it out. Yep. Nice. All right, man. Well, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, Send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E.com. Thanks for your support, and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest nigga be the coldest. People in-